Hey y'all. All right, so uh, what I want to do here is I want to um, lay out for you uh, two different models, different but related, uh, to help you better understand uh, both what we're doing this semester and how to better understand American and Nevada politics. So I start out by providing uh, for you through both lecture notes and narrated slides, and both of those components are important in terms of delivering material to y'all. Um, an empirical model. All right, that, that is essentially, it means a, a model designed to help us better understand how the world around us operates. Okay, simply uh, studying and understanding that which is, that which happens. All right, so it's meant to be relatively value neutral in terms of just figuring out what's happened in our politics and why did it happen in that way. And that's what we call it political science. We try to reduce the study of politics, not politics itself, but the study of politics to a, uh, a science. Not quite as rigorous, right, as physics or mathematics, but that's, that's, the, that's the model. All right, so, uh, so we start out uh, with a, an, an empirical model, a framework for better understanding uh, what happens in our politics. All right, I create a pyramid of sorts, an analytical pyramid. At the base of that are structural factors that we should always think about when we're trying to explain and understand something that's happened in our politics. Structural factors, as the name implies, are the big picture items, uh, things like uh, the arc of American history, uh, our political culture, our racial and ethnic demographics, our religious demographics, our geographic demographics, uh, our, our position in the world uh, today as the world's only global superpower. Uh, so those, that's one category of factors we'll be looking at at the beginning of the semester to better understand why things happen in the way that they do. Uh, and then we move up that analytical pyramid and we look at uh, political factors, as, as I identify them, political factors that shape what goes on in our politics. That would be things like our two political parties, occasionally third parties, we'll talk about that later. Uh, that would be things like elections, that would be things like social movements, uh, that would be um, things like uh, interest groups. Uh, yeah, these sorts of things. Things that, again, shape our politics in fundamental ways. And then finally, at the top of that pyramid would be kind of the three branches of government spiel, right? Things like uh, the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judicial branch at the, at, the, at the federal level, and of course also at the state and local level right here in Nevada and Las Vegas. Uh, so that's uh, that's an empirical model that if you grasp that, and it's, it's easier than it's, it's harder than it sounds, uh, but if you can grasp that as a basic model for understanding what happens in our politics, you're you're you're, you're ahead of the game. And then I uh, I use uh, what's often called America's Second Reconstruction to apply that model to a particular event. Uh, our Second Reconstruction, as the name implies, follows our first failed Reconstruction. Right, which would have been an attempt to remake America uh, after the Civil War, right? An America in which we no longer have the institution of slavery. Uh, I think Lincoln, I think at his Gettysburg Address, called it something like a, a rebirth of American democracy. Uh, and, uh, right, and and we so we, we we see as part of that first Reconstruction things like the Thirteenth Amendment abolishing slavery. The 14th Amendment, equal protection of the law, and uh, a broad definition of citizenship. If you're natural born, if you're born here, you are automatically a citizen. Uh, and uh, finally, the 15th Amendment, protecting uh, voting rights for the newly freed male slaves. Uh, women right, come along a bit later in terms of federal guarantees, not until the early 20th century. So that's our first reconstruction, right? An attempt to re remake America, both physically in terms of rebuilding the destroyed South, but also, more importantly, I think, politically. Right? Create a country committed to the Declaration's claim that all men are created equal. Tragically, of course, right? we know that this uh, first reconstruction fails after about 1876. So it runs from roughly 1864, end of the Civil War, to about 1876. Uh, and at that point, uh, the political will by the North to impose Reconstruction on the South essentially disintegrates, right? And so those efforts to remake America fail. 
uh, we do not atone for our original sin. And uh, Jim Crow rises in the South. The KKK rises in the South. The 13th Amendment is undercut in a variety of ways. Uh, the 14th Amendment is undercut uh, with intensity through Jim Crow and segregation. And the 15th Amendment goes by the wayside with things like grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literacy uh, requirements, and so on. All right, so it's, a, it's an abysmal and, and tragic failure. We finally right, revisit that failure in the mid to late 20th century in the form of the Black Civil Rights Movement that kicks off either in 1954, some would say, with Brown v. Board of Education, a decision by the Supreme Court uh, outlawing racially segregated public schools under the terms of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Uh, others would say, oh, well, it's more like the Montgomery bus boycott in uh, 55, 56, where a young uh, preacher by the name of uh, Martin Luther King, you may have heard of that guy, um, uh, leads a, uh, a boycott of the segregated busing system in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, right, that's where you get the mass partition. That's where you get the beginnings of mass participation in the Black Civil Rights Movement. Brown v. Board was more, more about the NAACP's legal team litigating an issue that was important, but it wasn't mass-based. The Montgomery bus boycotts are mass-based. So anyway, some would say that that's when the second reconstruction begins, either 54 or 55, it's all good. And then it culminates, right, with passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. These are efforts, right, to revisit the failure of the first reconstruction. Some would say that is our second reconstruction, relatively successful compared to the first one. Obviously, right, still limits to what that's accomplished. We'll be talking about that repeatedly throughout the course of the semester. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly uh, comparatively successful relative to that first reconstruction. So I use that second reconstruction to apply that empirical model. Can we use structural factors to better understand why that happened and, and what it was about? Absolutely we can. I try to show that in the slides and lecture notes. Can we use those political factors to better understand what happened and why? Absolutely. I make that argument. And then finally, right, political factors, the role of Congress, the role of uh, the Supreme Court, the federal courts, the role of uh, Congress, and so on. So that's the empirical model, and I'll try to sell you on the idea that it's a super useful model. Uh, and you can usually get broad agreement on this empirical model because it's pretty value neutral and just meant to be really just a, an, an understanding of what happens. But then, right, we also need to make judgments about what happens. Is what's happened a good thing or a bad thing? Because right, that's what we need to do as citizens, don't we? We need to understand what's going on in our politics at some basic level at least, but then we need to decide, do we go this way or do we go that way? Do I vote for this candidate or that candidate? Do I support this party or that party? Right? So you have to make value judgments. That's the uh, normative model that I lay out for you guys in a separate set of slides and, and notes. What is this uh, uh, normative model that we're going to use? The democratic ethos defined as... Uh, Popular sovereignty, right? Power to the people, rule by the majority is what it boils down to. Um, fundamental rights and liberties that attest to all individuals, things like free speech, right? Free, uh, freedom uh, to keep and bear arms, uh, the freedom of and from religion, freedom from cruel and unusual punishments, on and on. And then finally, um, political equality, right? Equal protection under the law. Uh, does each uh, person have a vote? Uh, does each person's vote matter as much as the other person's? It gets complicated pretty quickly, but those are the three components that we use to evaluate the quality of what's happening in American politics. Is what's happening in our politics advancing popular sovereignty, fundamental rights and liberties, political equality? If it is, if we believe that it is, we'll say, yeah, keep doing that. Uh, if we think it's not doing that, maybe producing the opposite, exacerbating political inequalities, um, somehow infringing on popular sovereignty, uh, undercutting um, fundamental rights and liberties. We're going to argue against that, right? But everyone's going to make their own judgments there, right, as to how you apply that model. We can agree, I think, I hope, that the model itself is pretty pretty legit, uh, pretty broadly acceptable to we the people. Right? Who's going to be against the democratic ethos defined in those ways? Hopefully nobody, or at least almost nobody. Um but then, right, how we apply that model to particular events, we're going to disagree on intensely, and that's why we have two parties. 
That's why we have President Trump running against some Democrat in 2020 is because we right we uh, we disagree over uh, what's the right direction to take. What is advancing the democratic ethos? Which path do we take? Lots of disagreement there. That's not only inevitable, it's actually a good thing, right? Because when you have freedom and liberty, you have lots of disagreements over exactly those sorts of things. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish here, people, with this, uh, this preamble module. And that's why I'm laying out two different models, one empirical, one normative. They're both important. They are separate, but they're also connected, if that makes any sense. So uh, check out those slides, people. Check out those lecture notes. And do the assigned readings in our text. It's not much to start with, right? I really just decided to take a substantive portion of that chapter on civil rights, uh, the Black Civil Rights Movement, just so you can see this is what the models are being used to uh, to better understand. All right, so um, there you have it. Any questions, let me know. Any logistical problems, let me know about that. I depend on student feedback to make sure things are uh, the content that I'm providing is is open, accessible, and functional. Thanks all.